Looks like we're live again, broadcasting from Round Rock, Texas. I'm Martin Sobretti, I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, and we are here for another session number 54 of uh, Chalcedon Q&A and Little Meat of the Word, where we take your questions, some of them submitted in advance online at ask.chalcedon at chalcedon.edu, and then the live ones thereafter, once we've exhausted the ones that were sent in advance, which we take in the order they were received, first come, first served, then we get to your live questions. So we'll go ahead and start with what we have here. Interesting question here. You have mentioned that Rashduni emphasized that he was just, quote, scratching the surface, unquote, when it came to application of biblical law to everyday life. What would you say are the top three areas that still need to be developed? How would someone know if he, she was capable or called to do so. So that's an interesting question. We certainly have a whole uh, lot of areas that need to have the light of God's word shine into those dark corners uh, to reprove the works of darkness. And of course, one way in which darkness prevails is through um, the truth being staggering off in the street and falling in the street and no one lifting up a finger to help it uh, because the truth is often suppressed. And it's this element of suppression, I think, that is, is key to a lot of the issues that we face today. So I'll give you some examples of areas where I think the light of God's word and the application of his law would be useful because it would lead to the truth and, uh, and, and tremendous value for the kingdom of God and for mankind in general. Uh, for example, and we have another question, I think it's the third question about climate change, so I'll just bring that up first and so we'll get a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that's okay. Uh, scientist Michael Mann made the so-called hockey stick discovery that said, oh, as we move farther along, there's a sudden rise in global temperatures that occurred as the industrial age set on. So uh, all the data is designed to reflect that and is interpreted in that interpret uh, form. Along comes uh, folks that analyze it, like at climateaudit.org. We have an individual who did some uh, interesting work to show that if you use the original data, that hockey stick disappears. Uh, what happened to the pretext for climate change and all this governmental intervention? it kind of uh, disappears on us, doesn't it? So what happened is that they started uh, preventing the analysts from getting the data. In other words, they said, we will disallow you from looking at the data. It is now rendered inaccessible. So only the experts who agree with the paradigm are allowed to even look at the data uh, because if you were to look at it, it doesn't look too good because you see all the assumptions, all the fudging, all the data points they threw out, all the things that they included that shouldn't have to bend and twist the data to a preconceived idea. So what happens is that when the truth is not prevailing, then we are being moved into various different areas and that's gonna hurt us. Uh, something in the sciences, this is an area where a lot of uh, um, reconstruction is required, where the law of God and the truth of God needs to be applied. One of the world's experts, this is back you now some a decade or two old, Halton Arp was probably at the time the uh, world's expert in quasars and in use of the Palomar 200-inch reflector telescope. Uh, and uh, he was even uh, received the Senior Scientist Award, Humboldt Award, a senior scientist, uh, and the very year that he was thrown off the telescope and barred from using it. Why? Because the results of his research tended to cast doubt on the Big Bang Theory. Consequently, though he had no creationist uh, implications behind him, they, they said, well, we don't want this continued stream of research, quite compelling, to uh, persist and to snowball. Best way, throw him out of here. Get rid of this guy. And so, of course, they suppressed the evidence. They threw the man off. Uh, and uh, therefore, there is no living voice in the defense of the truth. And this happened, by the way, in church pulpits as well. Uh, the truth is not welcome there either. Uh, an example that I'm going to have uh, Ground Control put up, I hope she got my uh, uh, email before I sent it, is the relationship of man to plague, man to plague. Now, Dr. Rushdie wrote on this, and we published it in 2010 on the website, as a chapter out of his book on overpopulation. And it's this. Uh, Contrary, it says, there are scholars who trace the incidence of plague to a change in the nature of man. In other words, a change in man's conception of his nature, a change of faith. And he re references uh, Dr. J. H. Vandenberg of the University of Leiden in his work, The Human Body, which is not yet translated into English as of the time that Rushdie was writing this. Uh, and he shows that the 
Incidents of plague with a radical development in human thought, they correlate, which shatters man's previous conception of himself and the world. Uh, and uh, when a plague disappears, according to Vandenberg, various reasons are cited. He says you know, immunity to bacillus, but that doesn't exist. Argue that better hygiene eliminated the plague, but there's no evidence of any correlation between hygiene and the retreat of the plague. He gives evidence in, in some interesting areas. Thank you, Grind Control. Uh, he shows that though a couple of nations in 1840 uh, did have improved uh, hygiene, Persia did not, still the plague disappeared. Uh, fourth, fifth, and uh, third, fourth, and fifth reasons are all uh, brought to the table and discredited by the actual facts of the case. And this is where it gets interesting. Thus, Vandenberg states, there's been no acceptable explanation until now for the disappearance of the plague from Europe. From 1348 to 1680, the plague was epidemic in Europe. Before 1348 and after 1680, the plague was local and brief-lived in Europe, or brief-lived. Why the relative immunity before 1348 and after 1680? According to Vandenberg, there will never be found a reasonable explanation without resort to causes of a what metabletic nature as well as to natural cause, causes. A change in man's conception of himself, of his inner world, produces a new relationship to the world and a loss of older certainties and immunities. Here's in italics, Dr. Rushton, put in italics. Plagues are thus not matters of rats or rat fleas, but a human matter. The plague occurs not because of rats or fleas, not because of man's environment, but because man changes. And therefore, the world changes for him. The changing outlook of man thus is important to a history of man's susceptibility to plague. Now, the question is, do, who's doing this research today? Now, here's a whole area where someone can definitely jump on in and say, hey, why aren't we researching this? It's because we want to have a, uh, the conventional viewpoint which uh, exonerates man and his faith and his lawlessness with having any hand in how nature reacts to it. In other words, it's a wholesale rejection of what Romans 8.19 talks about, that the whole creation is subjected to futility uh, on, for man's sake. And one of the ways in which this happens is with plague. So here's another area where we're open to analysis and people running in there and applying the Word of God. Obviously, uh, economics is an area where you, we can do work as well. Uh, and I think that's still, the, the fact that we're still arguing economics and that Marxism and Keynesianism and monetarism still prevail against a more biblical approach is indicative of the fact that we need to get our ducks in a row in economics. Uh, so, oh, uh, here's another interesting area of um, uh, suppression of evidence where there's an open door for us to, to do reconstruction, to uh, apply God's law, apply God's word. Uh, it's the case of uh, when Eddington, Sir Arthur Eddington, went down South America to, in 1919 to uh, photograph plates of a, during an eclipse to prove Einstein's general relativity theory. And it's astonishing how much of the data was thrown out and fudged to get the desired result. And it uh, actually raises the question, why do we always point to the 1919 results? Because all the plates that have been accumulated thereafter are even less prone to being monkeyed with. <laughs> uh, they're smoking guns for the opposite position, let's put it that way. So there you go, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue there. Now this question uh, continued, how would someone know if he or she was capable or called to do so? Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, there comes a stage in history where you see the need and you say, okay, Lord, here am I, send me. When I started working on linguistics, I had no knowledge of that field, and I had to acquire it on the run, but I was interested to see if the Bible applied to linguistics. I know similar individuals who, uh, a dispensationalist mathematician, who had uh, run, I think, almost a dozen uh, doctoral candidates through the mathematics program at the University of Rochester, Institute of Rochester Institute of Technology, I believe, or was it University of Illinois? One of those two places. Uh, so he's a high-end uh, mathematics fellow, PhD, and he was convinced that uh, mathematics was neutral and there was nothing, no area there for the law of God and the Word of God to apply. Then he read the works by Poitras and James Nichol and came to realize he was wrong. And then he switched gears, and now he uh, is more of an inclined to take that into account as a serious area where neutrality does not apply. So the first thing to think is, is there an area of neutrality which I can falsify? Uh, uh, by bringing the law of God to bear on it. The law of God tends to deal with ethical matters, but also de deals with the relationship with the world at large. It even deals with conservation matters, as we've talked about the least commandment, um, Deuteronomy 22, verses uh, 6 and 7. So, here am I, send me. If you, uh, God puts it on your heart, you have a hunger, you see the hole in the, in the, the need, and no one else is gathering, then you stand in the gap. 
It's that simple. Uh, or you support people who are willing to stand in the gap. You, you work with people who say, hey, who, who, I can't, but maybe someone else can, and I can support him in that work. So all that to mean that, yeah, Moses is there, but maybe you need a, her and Aaron to lift his arms up to get the job done. Next question. For a number of years, the idea of courtship was promoted rather than dating. In some cases, this produced young people of marriageable age not equipped as to how to get to know someone before immediately discerning suitability for marriage. There are many well into their 30s not yet married, although wishing they were. Would you comment on this? Well, I think the issue here is that we, um, there's, I think, many, many different extremes <laughs> that, uh, and, and people seem to gravitate into each of these little pockets. Uh, one favoring the original, the dating model, which is relatively contemporary, the courtship model, which is dated, but uh, yeah, no pun intended. Um, and then, of course, the notion that uh, your parents will find your mate for you, which is really dated and an older ancient view, if you will. Uh, and each of these survives in a different form in Christendom. And it's not clear to me that any one of them, maybe each of them has a part of the truth, but no one of them, uh, because they take that particular truth and expand it to the whole, then we don't get the, the truth of it. We don't get the whole truth. We get partial truth. And that's why it's important if you don't have the whole truth, the, the whole word of God being applied, the entire wisdom that is available to us, that we might end up with a negative result at the end. So that to say, uh, this is probably another area where we could say, hey, how about we continue to reconstruct this area uh, so that we have strong marriages as a result, and we we don't have people who are uh, now. I don't I'm not so terribly bothered if someone is in their 30s, um, but they're that First Corinthians 7 woman or man who's focused on the on the kingdom of God and propelling it forward and pushing it forward with all their might, shoulder into the glacier, move it. If they're doing that, then I'm not so inclined to say, hey, stop stop working for the kingdom of God and let's get you a spouse. Uh, unless the spouse is going to go right next to them and push on the glacier with their shoulder too, then we're working with one shoulder, as the phrase in Zephaniah 3.9 puts it. So it, that all depends. But I think it's, again, an area where each side say, sees the flaws in the other position more than it sees its own flaws. That's the way it's, it's been here in uh, the area. And it's not that people don't have good intentions or want to try to bring a biblical position. And uh, so each of the positions has a particular strength and weaknesses. And when you have special pleading, that's a logical fallacy. It means you promote and only push the positive side of yours and the negative side of the other position, but you don't ever reverse that and acknowledge the strengths of the other positions or the other approaches and the weaknesses in yours. Uh, so all that to say, no one wants to get together because people write books. Uh, they have a vested stake in the position that they've staked out. And so, boom, uh, it, it's tougher to get... Um, flexibility and openness to uh, a wider perspective that might be a synthesis of all of these approaches where the concerns of each position are met without the weaknesses of each position also plaguing the path of those who are trying to uh, find a spouse because you can't deny that who finds a good wife finds a good thing right? her worth might be um, far above rubies so uh, to put all sorts of breaks on that process uh, is, is a problem. So here is wisdom, right? We need wisdom and we, we tend to lack it. We tend to uh, put formulas together and it's I think a more of an organic thing than it is a structured hierarchical step-by-step -step, uh, fill out the form approach. And again right there I caricatured these views. That wasn't fair of me either. But the, the point I'm making when I say that is uh, each position does have that level of rigidity in it uh, as it regards its um, competing models. Climate change seems to be the default position when it comes to the need for statist intervention and controls. How should the Christian decipher between what is true and what is propaganda in this regard? So again, we're dealing with the question of a, of a crisis. Uh, when Dr. Rashtuni wrote The Myth of Overpopulation, overpopulation was a crisis, and if we don't do something right now through government power, uh, we're, we're all going to be starving to death. We're going to have massive starvation on a global scale, you know, billions and trillions starving, uh, corpses stinking to high heaven as it were. So the crisis is the main thing to put across and uh, because the crisis then is the lever, the social lever that, uh, that gets action uh, and accrues power centrally at the government to then take charge and fix the crisis. So the crisis is the pretext to be exploited by the civil government. This happens uh, with climate change, it happens with overpopulation, it even happens with language. Uh, when I um, lectured in 
Australia, one of my lectures was on the topic of language, linguistics particularly. And let me see, where is my little quotation here that'd be useful? Oh yeah, here we go. So, um, so the uh, crisis, real or imagined, becomes the pretext for government intervention. This is my writing. English is no stranger to open linguistic warfare. Here's a quotation. Uh, I think it's from Sh uh, Shuin. Uh, I'd have to look up at the back because these are endnotes and not footnotes. Terrible. And I didn't print the endnotes. For the past 1,500 years, give or take, the English language has been under attack. It appears that a language crisis has been in effect for the English-speaking world in every decade since the 16th century. Every decade, there has been a crisis asserted by the experts, and the uh, crisis is used to say we must do something. Can't do nothing, got to do something, right? But then the uh, same writer says, yet it's often difficult to tell when a language crisis is or is not occurring. Uh, an alleged crisis may simply be the result of the truism, people talk, language drifts. But the power brokers cry wolf out of self-interest. And then the elitists blame the people for the crisis. The people need the critics to save them from themselves. Quotation here. The greatest threats to the survival of our language come from the speakers and writers of English themselves, and the government will step in if the critics fail. So here again, crisis, crisis, crisis. If there's a crisis, uh, by the way, talking about crisis, don't we hear this word a lot about the crisis in the White House? Oh, we have to do something about that. Uh, wherever the crisis is, it's a call for governmental action. And if governmental action is not adequate, it's a call to run into the streets and be a mob, right? So the crisis, and by the way, mobs are their own kind of crisis. You meet crisis with crisis. Uh, Otto Scott called this the old trick, to use any kind of crisis as a pretext to expand government powers. And Rahm Emanuel put it in different language as a, an expander of his government powers. He said, don't let any good crisis go to waste. That's your, your signal to take it and exploit it and expand powers, expand the taxation, expand our authority, add more police, add more regulatory agencies, continue to exert more and more external government to control the people. Because ultimately, the biggest crisis for the government is the people themselves. Because a foreign enemy is an occasional threat, but you enemy within, which is your own populace, they're there 24-7. And if they get unhappy and the bread and circuses run out and they're not appeased by that, then you have a real crisis. <laughs> and a crisis of faith is what we're facing too in this nation. It's a whole different ballgame. The upshot is climate change is in the same category. That's why uh, when the climateaudit.org uh, they actually analyze, say, the, the ice core samples. What happens is that in order to figure out what happened way in the past, you need to have what's called a proxy, a statistical piece of data that you can analyze and look at it and say, well, the temperatures were such and so, or these tree rings show us this and that. And what the folks at climateaudit.org did is that they then analyzed anew with fresh eyes, without prejudice and biases built into a crisis mentality, the data and says, but it doesn't show what you guys are saying. This crisis is not anywhere near the scope and caliber that you guys are urging for governmental action. Therefore, these folks, their input is denied and we don't see um, them represented in the International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. Uh, they're not welcome because they deal with the truth. And uh, that's a revolutionary act to speak the truth in an age of power. So there you go. Uh, I would have to say almost all things are propaganda in respect to climate change. Uh, the very fact that they are unwilling to uh, release the actual data, the raw data, uh, which would then show how they manipulated and bent it because then they'd be exposed is indicative of exactly this kind of problem. So, yeah, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Exploit it. Uh, that actually happened uh, on Moses' watch, right? All of a sudden, the uh, um, chariots are coming and, and they want to call for Moses' head and head back to Egypt. Yeah, the, those who were slavish in their approach wanted to justify that. Or Haggai 1, right? Hey, it's not time for us to build a temple of the Lord. It's time for us to worry about our own houses, things on that order. Okay. Question four. Lifespan decreased after the flood. Was this also the case for a woman's fertility and a man's virility? It would seem so, since when God told Abraham he was to have a son, he and his Sarah, 90 and 100 respectively, were past that point in their lives. Please comment. Certainly the lifespan's... Uh, uh, did shrink, and of course that means there would be few, less opportunity to have children at, say, age 500. It's not going to happen. So uh, if you want to talk about fertility, does that mean uh, you only allow, you know, it's hard to have more than one human being, uh, singleton, single birth, 
um, any closer than nine months apart. And in fact, if, you know, following biblical law, there would be some point of time after childbirth by which there should be no more uh, um, uh, marital relations occurring for the sake of the wife and the healing, etc. But the, uh, the interesting question here is, is um, did they have like larger, more people were born, more twins, more triplets? Would that be evidence of greater uh, fecundity? God is the God who opens and closes the womb. This is very, very clear in Scripture. And therefore, the first who, um, creature that breaketh the matrix of the womb is the firstborn, and God has this particular claim on that because he's in charge of everything that openeth the womb, the matrix of the womb. So, all this to say, I'm not sure that we would necessarily correlate the two. The numbers of those who uh, will be conceived and become human beings as a result are, uh, that number's in God's hands. He knows it, and it is fixed already in eternity. So whether there is a uh, improvement in fertility or virility, we do not know. There certainly are secondary effects that can affect or alter or harm modern fertility. Uh, and for that matter, masculinity. If you look at one of my articles on um, the effects of methadone on the male, the testosterone levels drop. This is an interesting area of suppression again where I point out that the research studies, which were published in very serious journals, they went out of their way to try to say, well, you know, there's some pretty serious implications because if we mention the fact that you get on these uh, program, anti-drug programs, that your testosterone level will be so low that, it, that it'll be lower than a woman's, in other words, there'll be an, a, an, a feminizing effect as a result of these drugs, then a lot, of, a lot of men will say, why would I want that? And so they will uh, steer away from methadone, which is the, the so-called gold standard, in fact it's not, it's just another narcotic, uh, as my articles make clear. So here they want to suppress it. They say, well, that's irresponsible to tell the people the truth about what happens when they're on methadone. You should not tell them the effects on their testosterone and thus their, thus their virility <laughs> uh, on account of that because it's more important that they get on methadone and that we tolerate this uh, fact. Um, this fact, by the way, was known way back in the days of the, um, the uh, opium wars and stuff where the recumbent users of, uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, recumbent users um, were extremely effeminate. But the results that were more recent in the last couple of decades, you know, the, they did a test of folks who are on methadone in a particular area and they got the results back and they sent, sent back and said, no, no, you were supposed to test males. You obviously sent us female uh, methadone users and the results came back, no, no, those are all males, all of them. And yet their levels were, looked like they were women in respect to how much testosterone was in their blood. So that can also affect virility, to say the least. Um, other factors come into play. It's more complex. Command's a very, very complex thing. So to simply say it's a simple matter uh, that the fecundity is down. Certainly, we've expanded to many uh, people on the plant face on the planet at this point, and perhaps it can bear more if people obey God's word. But as Rush Tony pointed out, the North American continent already was overpopulated with maybe half a million. Native Americans on it because the mechanism by which they gained food was not adequate to feed them. It was just on the bare level of subsistence. Uh, but once you actually work the earth in such a way that it yields her strength to you, that changes the story radically. And the land can bear many, many more people than that. So, next question. I've been listening to Rush Tooney's teaching for some months now, and you can't go without noticing his ability to think in terms of all of Scripture. This made me wonder what were, what were Dr. Rastuni's studying habits, both for the Bible and for other literature. Also, what are some practical studying tips that you, Martin, might give to an individual or family who want to receive the benefits of all of God's Word as well as other books? I can tell you a little bit about how he did other books, is that he would have a, you know, a pen or paper and a ruler, like a six-inch ruler, and anything that was important to him, he would underline it in the book, and he would make notations in the back of the book with the page number, uh, of those points that he thought were important that he would want to revisit in a study and he wouldn't know in advance so he'd kind of catalog these things and say these books have these elements in them that would be useful um, to document certain truths that are w poorly understood today but he's dug digging through all these unusual books uh, popping the hood if you will on modern scholarship so that was one of the ways that he was able to become if you will a walking encyclopedia is that he uh, focused and then he didn't treat the book casually. Even a book he disagreed with, he would often have a lot of underlines and explain so he would grasp the thinking of that individual and he would put it in a perspective uh, and that would allow him to um, not only grasp it but to also uh, exercise knowledge in regard to it, expose it. 
I know he had read through the Bible many, many times, and his studies of the scriptures were indicative uh, that he would uh, exhaust all the commentaries when he was looking at a particular verse. He took it very seriously when he um, lectured from scripture, and he even put off teaching from Romans years because he said uh, uh, it's a book that kind of set him aback because his view, and this is where this idea of scratching the surface really comes in, uh, he says, you know, there's a book that only the surface has been scratched. They're only talking about the soteriology of it and maybe a little bit of the, uh, the Calvinistic components of the book. But the depth of it is, is abandoned. He wanted to at least expose some of the deeper parts of the Book of Romans that were being sloughed over because it didn't fit the template being applied by a lot of scholars in the past who uh, did right so far as they went but just stopped going all the way. It's like Joash only fired, you know, two or three arrows into the ground instead of all of them. And so too, Rush Tony says, we, in, a, in a work of work of the God, we need to grab all the arrows and fire them all. Use it. Dig in. And so uh, now the question then arises, what's my approach? Uh, I am peculiar in this is that I take the position, and I'm paraphrasing from what Paul says in Corinthians, better five words that are understood than a thousand that aren't. So if I had a choice between advising someone read a whole book of scripture, a whole chapter, or rather you say um, an epistle or a prophet, uh, and, or say reading half a chapter of it and understanding it, getting grappling with it, checking the commentaries, sanctified scholarship that's been consecrated for 21 centuries, I would counsel the better because you can actually apply that. There's a misunderstanding, I think, about that phrase in Psalm 119 about the man who hides God's word in his is heart. Uh, memorizing scripture is hiding God's word in your head. It's not in your heart. From the heart proceed all the issues of life. There an application is possible and an application is only possible if you understand it. If you don't understand it, like the um, eunuch uh, that Philip spoke to, he says, how can I understand it? If I don't understand it, I certainly can't apply it, right? Uh, what good is it if I don't have someone opening up the scripture? It has to be opened up. And uh, that's why Philip hopped up into the with the fellow and said, I'll walk you through Isaiah. After the talk of um, opening up Isaiah, the man's ready to be baptized. So obviously there's some implications there. If you wonder, well, what does Isaiah have to do with baptism? Well, it's right there in the 52nd chapter, right? He shall sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. The Lord, the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and brought salvation with it. So it's in there <laughs> if you care to look. So all that to say, uh, your study needs to be deeper. If you had to just pick one commentary and focus on it and have your family focus on what he had to say, probably Matthew Henry will get you more meat for your family than almost anything out there. Uh, a lot of other things are technical and you need to synthesize those things and pass them on to uh, age appropriately to your children or lift them up to where you are. Uh, that's always a possibility. But again, better five words that are understood than a thousand that aren't. Rushton, he was content to get to those five words and understand them. And once you understand something, you can sh uh, reproduce that scholarship in someone else, your children. Or if you're a teacher at a Christian school, then you can pass that on. And the teacher, uh, students can grasp that and they can build their lives on that rock as well. So the main thing is, if you understand it, you can apply it, it's in your heart. And that's what I think is necessary to actually understand it. Not just merely to read it. Lots of things, you know, we talk about going in one ear or out the other. Same thing with eyes. I, I read the whole page, I don't know what I just read. Okay, that's not going to help. It, scripture needs to be opened up, and the eunuch was right to challenge Philip. Says, what good is it, this scroll of Isaiah, if I can't understand it? It's no good. Just great words. Now, there are others who say, by the way, if you're a three-year-old, can memorize the shorter catechism. That's true. They're human sponges, and that can come into play. Warfield defended this policy with the very, very young, saying, if you were, uh, but then again, the the there's two issues there. One, you have the benefit that the Shorter Catechism teaches those truths, and those truths then become, because there's a Q and A, it's a didactic function, question, answer, question, answer, and so the mind kind of absorbs that component, uh, Socratic, if you will, you know, pseudo-Socratic method, and the mind can absorb that, and therefore it can kind of set the feet of the child on the right path as a result. But by the same token, it is not scripture. It is a uh, one or two steps removed from scripture, not mu by much, but enough that it's not the same thing because the entering in of thy word bringeth light. So the light comes from scripture, not from even excellent commentaries on scripture. It doesn't come from Rashtuni's commentaries or books. It comes from scripture itself. 
So we always must be pointing people back to the Bible so that if you read Rosh on a passage and you go look at the scripture and you look at the cross-references and you grasp it and you test him too, uh, as ever all Bereans must. To the law and the testimony, they speak not according to these because there's no light in them. All of us see through a glass darkly, which means our best commentaries today are still flawed. Therefore, we must go back to the scripture. Okay, I'm seeing that there's some live questions coming up, but we'll come back and get those. So do not worry about that. All right. Uh, what exactly does it mean to be least in the kingdom of heaven? Barely in, not in at all. Please clarify. Yeah, you're in. The question is what you're ranked. The um, James Moffat's translation says, uh, will be ranked lowest in the realm of heaven. That's the way he translates it. So it's not a matter that you're not in the kingdom of heaven. It's where you stand. It's that uh, instead of giving the king something big, uh, which is the result of your life's work, it's something very, very small um, because that's all you're able to cobble together because you were focused on other things and you were not focused on his law and the way to walk. Um, other pleasures of, uh, of the world interfered with that, and that's where the problem starts. And so it's an incentive. It's to motivate us to say, I'd like to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Seems to be not so hard to do. Think about it. I'm simply going to ask, walk in the blessings of Psalm 1. That's all I need to do. You know, blessed is the man who delights in the love of God and who meditates upon it night and day. He is like the tree planted by rivers of water who, uh, who delivers his fruit in season without ceasing, right? Uh, what happens with the man who's least in the kingdom of heaven, it's more like a couple of little pieces of fruit on one or two branches. Still there in the kingdom of heaven, but certainly not burgeoning and, 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 and uh, loaded with fruit unto the Lord. So it's a question of what we want to give back. And it's a reference to our gratitude to him that we would walk in the way he did. Because he paid a high price, That not that we would continue in sin, but that we would walk in righteousness. But we're still in, but it's like the um, gift of tongues, right? The gift of tongues, uh, the spiritual gifts. It's the consolation prize. It's the least of all the gifts, right? And so as someone who is of a charismatic mind, they always, I don't understand why they do this. They always try to say, you want to get that gift of tongues. It's so important for you to speak in tongues. They say, why would you promote that as the gift to get? It's the consolation prize. It's the least of the gifts. You should be inculcating... Um, uh, prophecy and knowledge of the, law, the Word of God or mercy, these are much greater things than tongues <laughs> as gifts go. But so for some reason we're focused on the least of the gifts. And for some reason a lot of those who are focused on the least of that gift are also focused on not following even the least of God's commandments and they will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And that's where we rank, if you will, uh, where we stand in respect to his kingdom. Okay, I hope that clarifies a little bit that it doesn't mean you're not in, it means you're in uh, and by barely, it's, it's not so much barely, but that your status is such that you had very, very little to give your king. And if that doesn't kick you into high gear, I'm not sure what will, especially knowing how what Christ paid to bring you in. Uh, okay, final question. As there was no death prior to the fall, would there have been seasons as we know them? Depend. I mean, there were seasons. The question is as we know them. In Genesis 1.14, the uh, stars and the sun and the moon were created for signs and, uh, and for seasons and for days and years, right? And so seasons did exist uh, prior to the fall. Uh, whether they had the notion of um, spring, which is something not yet occurring, the promise of uh, things coming out of the dead earth of winter, uh, versus uh, fall, where everything is dying, uh, and then death now grips and we head back into winter. So the question is, do we have this uh, death cycle, particularly in respect to vegetation? And the answer probably is no. Uh, because one thing for certain, on the other side of the consummation, things are very, very different. The, the uh, Lamb of God is the light, the kingdom of God, and the city of God, and uh, there is no sun to light it because the Lamb lights it. Uh, and we see that the tree of light, the, the trees that line, the tree of light that lines the river of life, so they bear their fruit uh, all year long. There's no seasons in terms of their fruit bearing. So whatever else is true, having continual light from the Lamb of God means that they bear the fruit continuously. And so there's no uh, f um, dying off of the fruit for a winter and for hunkering down uh, during that time period. So I think that, that answers the question pretty clearly. Let's see, going back to questions. 
to your... Okay, Rory, yes. See so if we can get uh, all of it. Let me pin it. If I pin it, I'll see, probably see the whole thing. Okay. To your knowledge, have there been uh, any serious reconstruction attempts when it comes to the area of drug and alcohol treatment? Um, the work that I've been doing uh, with the articles about Dr. Kishore, those, I think, are indicative of what is going on in terms of it. In terms of uh, Christian work with the uh, alcoholism and absinthe and other um, laudanum and other uh, earlier addictive substances goes back to the Washingtonian, to Martha Washington's work, the Washingtonian hospitals, and their efforts to uh, resolve this by promoting sobriety. Uh, and I think any Christian uh, response to the addiction crisis involves promoting the biblical value of sobriety, to be sober, to have be in, in um, full possession of your faculties. To the extent that you lose them, you are less than a man. This is going to the crimes of uh, putting the bottle in someone's mouth. I think that's the book of Habakkuk, where the, uh, the, the ruler exhibited his cruelty toward uh, conquered uh, leaders by getting them drunk, putting the bottle to their mouth to get them drunk, because the more irrational he could make them, the more he could separate them from the image of God and more like an animal. Uh, because rational thought is the one thing that distinguishes us from animals. So to, 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 to eradicate or smear the image of God in someone is to eradicate their rational thought, and that's one way to do it. So the, artic the 18 articles that I wrote uh, focus on one doctor's work in taking the Washingtonian approach, which had migrated into the t late 20th and 21st century uh, through him in his bo bodily person. Uh, uh, <coughs> he inherited, if you will, <coughs> the, the Washingtonian um, library and built upon that foundation uh, the work that he did, which in September 2011 was destroyed by the state of Massachusetts uh, in order to protect the um, methadone and suboxone monopolies. Because here was a man who a quarter million people went through, he had the highest success rates many times, 30, you know, seven and a half to 15, 30 times higher success rate keeping people sober than the state approved systems, and he didn't use any narcotics to do it. He actually used primary care medicine to do it. So Dr. Kishore's work is the, the key here, uh, certainly for the, the most dangerous drugs, the heroin, the um, uh, methamphetamines, the fentanyls in particular. Uh, and he also shows that the status solutions are terrible, which we would expect. If there's a biblical answer and it conflicts with the status answer, we'd expect much more fruit from a biblical approach such as Dr. Kishore had mounted and his frontal attack on the, uh, the crisis, if you will, he dealt with the crisis properly, using the proper tools and emphasizing the right things, and therefore his success was guaranteed because uh, he was on the right foundation. He was building on the rock. The state, on the other hand, is building on sand, and the, fact, the very fact that they even used methadone in the first place is kind of a crisis. Here's also something indicative of suppression of data. I mean, this, there's tons of it in this issue, and my articles bring it up. But one I want to bring out in particular is there's a medicine called Vivitrol, which Dr. Uh, Kishore was one of the pioneers in using it. Vivitrol is a shot every 30 days that makes it impossible for you to have a high. In other words, it removes any incentive to take one of these psychoactive addictive drugs. And um, therefore, it is a very good um, adjunct, not necessarily used in all cases, but in the cases where you want to keep someone on the straight and narrow uh, and get them sober for a year through all the four seasons, that's a very important point because of all the triggers that occur, to get them through that process. Uh, this drug can be a very, very useful thing, and it's harmless. It's not narcotic at all. It basically is a, is a blocks the receptors so that um, heroin doesn't have its effect or any other uh, euphoric would have no effect on you. Now, this drug was attacked by the FDA. They ran a test with enormously high levels of it on rats, I believe, mice or rats, and said, oh, there's a liver problem, hepatic uh, uh, issue, what do they call that, hepatotoxic effect. And uh, therefore, we're going to put a black box warning on it. It says, warning, if you take this drug, it could destroy your liver kind of message. It tantamount to that. And people, doctors are very remiss in prescribing any kind of medicine with a black box warning, which says, you know, it's just kill your liver and you can be dead anyway. So you know, they veer away from it. Now, unknown to the FDA, who had called a halt to all human testing of Vivitrol, apparently there was one jail population, a prison population, where they didn't get the memo. And they were still running the tests. And after a couple of years, they sent their results back showing no evidence at normal dosing of these, this medication of any harm to the liver. 
So it reversed the uh, results. Now that t testing should never have happened. They wanted to suppress the result and kill Vivitrol by saying it destroys your liver. But these, this prison population, they're going along just fine and, and, and it gives a lie to this claim that it's dangerous. And so uh, Vivitrol became the very first medication in FDA history to have the black box label removed. They didn't want to remove it, but they had no choice because now this unwelcome data showed up and they had to deal with it. They said, why on earth is it, where did this come from? I thought you guys stopped testing. We said to stop. No, no, we kept going. We, we never get a uh, message. Someone, maybe the <laughs> post office lost it. In any event, here is the truth. And they had to say, oh, well, I guess we're going to have to remove the black box uh, warning from Vivitrol. In the meantime, Dr. Rish, uh, Dr. Uh, Kishore had already been uh, prescribing it, and it was a great success. And so when they took his clinics down, no one was around to provide Vivitrol shots, and therefore the death rates, which were zero, zero under Dr. Kishore's watch. He had no one die who was under his treatment program. They suddenly rocketed as he's in jail. Go figure. That's uh, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Okay, Douglas. See, I have to probably pin this one too. If I pin it, I can see it. You mentioned seasons pre-fall. Are you talking the possibility of, or how long of time do you believe passed between creation and fall? Uh, I simply indicate that they were created for a purpose, for, uh, and there certainly was some period of time in which uh, all the creatures were brought to Adam to function as the world's first taxonomist. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Roy. Uh, yeah, in other words, he had to name all the animals and give them their characterizations and then the knowledge that none of them was suited for as a help meet for him, and then the creation of Eve. So whether it's a period of weeks, I do not know, maybe um, some months, uh, but there were how many seasons of any did Adam experience? I think the fall happened relatively quickly. It was um, the devil's intention to poison this work as quickly as he could. So it could have been days, weeks, months. I do not believe it was years. Uh, I just don't think the, the the testimony in scripture allows that much loosey-goosey room for that. So certainly not the kind of long time that is alleged by long earth, um, old earth creationists. I believe that is not a, does not fly. Oh, thank you, uh, ground control. That's correct. The very first question was supposed to be, can you explain uh, Exodus 4, 19 to 26, what have you? All right, let's see. Let's pull it up. You'll need to read it. Um, I usually preach a lecture on this a sermon, and I call the uh, sermon Skeletons in the Closet, for very obvious reasons. The Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. So what this look, sounds like to Moses is, I'm safe, I'm off the hook. I, am, I can just beeline it to Egypt and get the business done with Pharaoh, and everything is cool. So he did not take into account that he had skeletons in the closet that were a barrier to him proceeding, and this became manifest uh, as we continue the discussion in Exodus 4. And Moses took his wife and his sons, they had two, Gershom and Eliezer, set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So here he is, told it's safe to go, no man, notice the emphasis, no man who sought his life is alive anymore. So he's got the God, rod of God, the staff of God in his hands, he's got his wife and his kids, so, and God sends us with a mission. And then things turn bad um, very, very shortly after that. The Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return to Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand, but I will, not, I will harden his heart, that he will not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So here he has this stupendous mission. He's got a set of miracles to boot. So everything's looking great for Moses. What could possibly go wrong? Well, Moses went wrong. Moses was the one who messed up and didn't even pay any attention to what was going on. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet, Moses' feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. And so he, God, let Moses go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. 
So he failed to circumcise his sons. The Abrahamic covenant was not being kept by Moses, yet he's going to call Abraham's children out of bondage when his own children had not been dealt with properly under God's requirement that they be circumcised on the eighth day. And here Moses says, I get a pass. Moses does not get a pass. None of us get a pass on God's requirements. It doesn't matter who you are. Peter doesn't get a pass. He gets told, get thee behind me, Satan. Nobody gets a pass. Moses doesn't get a pass later on when he strikes the rock uh, and to make the water come out and twice. And God's angry with them and says, you're not going into the promised land for that. You're going to die on Mount Pisgah. So these are all warnings to us what God will and will not allow. And so do we have skeletons in the closet? The lesson here is just because the people that sought our life are gone, does that mean that's the only part of the equation? Are we only looking down here at the human level? Or are we looking up or saying, he's the person with whom we have to do. He, capital H, he, is the one with whom we have to do, uh, before whom we're all exposed and naked, and we should take that into account. Just because God's giving an order doesn't mean that he's not expecting you to follow suit and get your house in order before you take off. And so this is uh, echoed in Paul's requirements that an elder must have their own house in order. If it is wildly out of order, how can he rule the house of God if he can't rule his own family? And so here, Mo Moses has not properly ruled his own family. He has caved in to Zephyrah's uh, rejection of circumcision. Uh, she's the one who prevailed upon him. He says, you're not touching these kids. <laughs> and God says, I'm touching you instead then. That's the choice. So God's way or a very, very bad way, the way that leads to destruction. So skeletons in the closet. Why do we preach it? Uh, why do I mention this under this context? Because we all have skeletons in the closet. And the sooner you deal with them, the better, because they can come home to roost when you don't expect it, when in fact everything is going great. Because Moses, like I said, he's got the staff, He's even God even says and reiterates, go do the miracles I showed you. You know, you can turn, you can do this, you can stand, it turns the staff into a snake, you can make your hand leprous, uh, all sorts of wonderful things. So, God, so he's chock full of miracles, he's got the mission, he's got his kids in tow, and of course the kids are a, exactly the thing that he's going to be indicted with, the condition of his children not being shown as covenant members of the household of faith. And he failed to see that they were marked as God's property. So they were outside of God's property, but he's bringing them into Egypt anyway. And God objects. God objects viscerally. So all that to say, that's what that's about. Some people say, you know, well, God lulled him into a uh, state of um, complacency, right? He says, everyone who sought your life. It didn't say everyone. Every man who sought to kill you is gone. But that is not the limit of the amount of things that can kill Moses. Because God also killeth and maketh alive, as Isaiah 45 informs us. Uh, and so, too, it says, then the Lord sought to kill him. So if you rule God out of your picture, um, that's a massive oversight, and it can come back in a terrible way. Okay, we're doing good on time. Mike, good to have you with us. Uh, any other comments today? Again, we have an upcoming Book of the Month Club. Uh, and if you are on Freud, that uh, Mark Rushton will be teaching in November, sign up for it if you're not already signed up. Uh, and uh, also, if you're interested in some of the previous ones, uh, Ground Control always sets them up a week after or so, available at Calcedon's website. So you can uh, hook in, but it's nice to be able to deal with it live because then you can participate and get your questions answered and uh, contribute what you got out of the book, which may edify others. Again, the mission of Chalcedon reduces pretty much to one idea. Let all things be done unto edification. If we're not building up the kingdom, then I guess we're slothful and uh, might be contributing to its decay. So if we can help put another brick in place in the wall that surrounds the kingdom of God, Zion, that's all to the good. And every brick counts, no matter how small. Uh, I think that's an important point uh, that someone might say, I don't have a lot to give. Well, that widow only had two mice to give but it mattered to the kingdom of God. Yeah, there we have the, kind of the um, registration for the Book of the Month Club on Freud. We have quite a few interesting books planned out for next year, so we, once we finish this year out, I think you'll be pleased. I know we have, um, I think December, am I doing uh, Foundations of Social Order? I believe that's the case. So I'll be uh, walking us through one of the most important books to Dr. Rush uh, I believe it's in uh, the December time frame. On the creeds and councils of the early churches, why would he call it foundations of social order? Why not church order? Because it 
has implications for the culture we live in. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we, I'm on December, so God willing, Deo Valenti, and I have no skeletons in the closet, I will be teaching out of the foundations of social order. Thank you for that. And again, if you want to ask questions in advance, just email your question to ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. We take those first, uh, and then move along to live questions, of which we had a couple so far, but haven't had anything yet come up in the feed. And uh, because dead air is terrible to have on air, we're going to make a point of allowing a little bit of time for final questions to come in, and then when those don't, then I know that that's God telling me it's time to take my staff and it turns into a serpent and head out. Any other questions coming up? Let's see if I missed anything on the points I was making. By the way, this whole issue of suppression of evidence Why would someone suppress the truth? I'm going to point everyone here to a book by Buddy Hansen. Because if you remember, Machiavelli in The Prince, he makes a point saying it's legitimate and practically actually recommended for the magistrate to lie to the people. That it's completely acceptable, in fact, wise policy to lie to the people. And so uh, Buddy Hansen noticed that after three and a half centuries, nobody had offered a Christian alternative to Machiavellian politics. So he wrote, as in opposition to Machiavelli's The Prince, his own book, The Christian Prince. And I highly recommend that because it shows what can be done if someone simply sees the need and says, you know, no one's touched this. No one's touched the Machiavelli all this time. We've certainly had a text, but no one's written a text that uh, can be pitted toe-to-toe -to -toe against Machiavelli point by point and give the biblical alternative and do so decisively. It doesn't mean that Buddy Hansen's book is perfect, but it's a stab of light into the dark, and that's what we need. And therefore, it lights the way for people to build on that. Okay, Nancy has a question for me. Let me take that. How do we reconcile the fact that our sinless Lord learned obedience by the things he suffered? Because the temptation was not to suffer, obviously. So uh, if you can, uh, you learn obedience uh, in this, that he did not necessarily do his own will, you know. He even made this comment, he said, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, right? Because, you know, if it's possible, let the cup pass from me. But I will go ahead and take it. So uh, certainly in his human frame, uh, because there's two un uh, natures in union, the hypostatic union, as theologians call it, uh, the temptation is always, you know, to resolve those things, even in the wilderness. Hey, you're hungry? Command these stones be made bread. Uh, so you can, you don't have to be hurting, you don't have to be in pain. There's a, a way around pain, there's a way around suffering. Uh, of course, it means you're not going to save anybody, but you're off the hook then. And uh, Jesus, uh, like Moses, says Moses preferred the kingdom of God to the riches of Egypt, right? He spurned them, so too. The greater Moses, Jesus, did the same thing. So to learn obedience in the sense that to actually suffer through the process of obeying, when obedience hurts and you say, I wish this cup would pass from me, and yet Christ said, nonetheless, not my will but thy will be done. And so that is how he learns to obey, that obedience carries a price. I remember when I was lecturing just uh, two weeks, weekends ago, I said, to do the right thing for your children, there's a price to pay. You're going to put them in a Christian school or homeschool them and pay for the uh, public schools through taxation. So you're paying twice. You have to teach them twice. You have to teach them the biblical truth and also the truth of the uh, alleged the lies of the evolution so they can know both sides and, con and uh, contradict and fight and, and do battle uh, and, and uh, rebuke and refute the, uh, the humanist position. Humanists don't have to learn the biblical position, but a smart Christian will know his position and his enemy's position. He's supposed to know his enemy's position better than the enemy knows his own position. So we have twice the work, twice the thing. So to learn obedience today carries a price. There's a price to pay to be the obedient to the living God in our uh, culture today. So that's the point that I would be making there, yeah. And so to Christ, he paid a tremendous price. But this is where the beautiful thing is, and it's in the, um, the... We all know about the part of Isaiah 53 that refers to the suffering Messiah, but then, what did it end up with? 
If it please the Lord to bruise him or crush him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Behold, he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Therefore the song bursts out in verse uh, chapter 54 of Isaiah. Sing, O barren, that thou, that thou that didst not bear, bring break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou, that thou that didst not prevail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. I love this passage. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thy inhabitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabitant. And it continues and continues in this tremendous blessing, all as a result of the vicarious atonement, the tremendous blessings that flow from that, from the seed being buried and died, then it brings forth the tremendous fruit. And we're part of that fruit, the harvest, that Christ purchased with his own blood and are bringing us to himself. So, all right, yeah, to get your answers, questions, get your questions answered first and uh, not have to wait in line for a live quest, question being answered, uh, you can send them to us and we'll, we'll take them. Uh, the fun part about being live is that, of course, we operate without a net. Uh, and some things show up so close to a broadcast time that it's essentially, I just glance at it quickly and say, okay, there we go. Yep, we are about done. So all your blessings, um, God's blessings upon each of you, and continue to apply the Word of God. If you have not yet set your um, feet on the path of reconstructing a particular area that you might be gifted in or are uncertain, take it to the Lord, and then be bold. Be bold. Let your torch shine brightly as you thrust it into the darkness, because the darkness cannot comprehend the light. It will not be able to control you if you are operating on God's terms. You will plant seed that will abide in the next generation. That's the only way to do it, in fact, because the seed that the humanists plant will not. It'll rot and decay because its days are numbered. We are living in a post-humanist era. Keep that in mind, as Rashtuni said. We're living in the era of post-humanism. It's got its death rows, and it's a very noisy death rows, and we see it all over the in social media and the news. Uh, and they are trying to protect their false gods with all their strength. In the meantime, we lean on the true God, and our cause will prevail. Thank you for your listening, and we'll see you all next week. God bless.